Welcome again to Live Stream, Stream Sunday School for Akron Alliance Fellowship Church. We're going to get started with the passage for today that we're going to be studying. It is the, in the book of Acts. We're continuing our study in the book of Acts. We're covering Acts chapter 13, verses 13 through 24. It is just a section of scripture. We're, we're doing a little bit at a time. We're not rifling through because um, what you're going to find in the next couple of messages, we'll be continuing this uh, as we get later on into the passage today. We're going to see where... Um, Paul is standing up is going to be speaking to the people in a, in the synagogue, but we're only going to start with the first part of that. But there's some other things to cover here in this particular lesson that we want to just have some context as to what we're looking at and what we're seeing today. So uh, with that in mind, we thank you for joining us for Sunday School. Uh, we still acknowledge there are not many churches that do a Sunday School, and I think that's sad. I think that really is. I think it's very important for us to engage with God's Word in a setting other than the, the worship service message, and this is the opportunity for you to do that, and also just make notes on the side, so that's why we do it, and we appreciate you being here, and I'm sorry that your hand still hurts and your ears clogged, but we're going to be praying for you and keep praying, amen? That's what we're going to do. So let's go ahead and look to the Lord with a word of prayer for, for Sunday School this morning, and let's get started. Father, thank you for this time that you have given to us now to sit quietly before you. And Lord, may the Spirit speak. May the words that are used not be my words, but yours, and that you indeed will provide wisdom, knowledge, and insight into what we're reading and experiencing, and maybe even answer some questions deep down about what we're looking at. And Lord, we just thank you for how you indeed uh, speak to us and how you encourage us. And Lord, we need your encouragement day after day. We just give you praise and thanks for all these things, and we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody, turn your Bibles, electronic devices to Acts chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 13 through 24. And we appreciate you joining us for this morning's lesson. And essentially, this is a part one. What we're going to be covering today is Paul and Barnabas traveling um, to a city, uh, Antioch of Pisidia. We'll, we'll read that and explain. Um, this is different from the Antioch that where they originated from. Um, and we're going to see some things here that are going to be very interesting as we look at perhaps what we see as the beginning of someone's ministry here as well. Let's read the passage, Acts chapter 13, verses 13 through 24, and kind of go over it. Uh, we always read from the New Living Translation, so we encourage you to follow along. Verse 13, Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, Landing at the port town of Perga, there John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. On the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for the services. After the usual readings from the books of Moses and the prophets, those in charge of the service sent them this message. Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. Verse 16. So Paul stood, lifted his hand to quiet them, and started speaking. Men of Israel, he said, and you God-fearing Gentiles, listen to me. Verse 17. The God of this nation of Israel chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. Then with a powerful arm, he led them out of their slavery. He put up with them through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Then he destroyed seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to Israel as an inheritance. Verse 20, all this took about 450 years. After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people begged for a king and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for 40 years. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And it is one of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised savior of Israel. Before he came, John the Baptist preached that all the people of Israel needed to repent of their sins and turn to God and be baptized. Okay, that's the passage we're covering for today. Acts chapter 13, verses 13 through 24. The content itself is relatively self-explanatory. It's basically Paul getting up 
and speaking in the synagogue uh, at Antioch of, in Pisidia. And we have to distinguish, this is not the same Antioch that we refer to uh, where we were seeing, seeing them being originating as far as the Gentile church was concerned. It's a different place altogether, and it's a place where there are Jews uh, are inhabiting this area. Let's go back up to the top. Verse 13, and recognize too that um, this is a continuation after they had left um, uh, Cyprus, and now they're sailing and moving uh, along here to this different region. They're going out further west of where they were before. Um, and again, this is what I would call one of the first missions trips. This is kind of what these gentlemen are doing here. Paul and Barnabas, they're traveling. But look at what it says in verse 13. I want you to see something very interesting here. Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There, John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, who is John Mark? John Mark is the relative of Barnabas. He's related to Barnabas. And he was traveling originally with them um, as part of this missions trip. He's younger. He is um, kind of just, I would say he's tagging along. I, I would say that he's even observing what's going on. I don't know that he was all that active in his travel. I, I don't want to speculate further than that. But what we're going to find is, is that he left. He didn't stay on the journey with them and went back to Jerusalem. And it's interesting how... Um, it's speculation, frankly, on why John Mark left Paul and Barnabas. And no one really knows exactly why. There's kind of a speculation as to what happened. Um, there's, some, there's a note here that says he might have been homesick. I don't know how they would know that. I mean, you know, he may have been. Um, but he didn't seem to be up for traveling long distances at that point, at least at that, at that particular time. Um, he perhaps, because Barnabas was related to him, Paul was kind of taking charge of the leadership of the group, right? He, they were following Paul. Now, Barnabas, remember, he gave up what he was doing as uh, head of the church uh, in Antioch, the other Antioch, and he was going with Paul and traveling together with him. And because Barnabas stepped back and allowed Paul to be a leader, that may have been an issue as well, too. Of course, they could have gotten, he could have gotten sick. You know, one thing we need to understand about these types of travels when they're going from place to place is not often mentioned, but if you, if you, everybody who's been seasick before, who's, you know, if you travel on a boat, <laughs> if you're traveling on a boat, uh, you'll, you'll need to take Dramamine because at the end of the day, I think I was on a dinner cruise one time actually, and, and I, all of a sudden I felt this little wave going on here, like, oh my goodness, it's like, I couldn't believe what was happening, so I, I took some Dramamine. But it's not unusual for these guys to come down with something or get sick as they traveled. And even, uh, just as an example, go to Galatians chapter 4. I, wanted, I want you to see something here that's pretty interesting. Because even Paul references it. Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to look at, yeah, verse 13. And just take it down through verse 15. Galatians 4, verse 13. And it's not mentioned a lot, but we should take this into account. These are human beings who, they're not superhuman. They get sick. They get stuff that happens. And we know about Timothy who, uh, Timothy had a, a sour stomach half the time and he had to drink wine just to settle his stomach because he was, I won't say he was sickly, but he certainly had that as an issue that he dealt with. We all have stuff we have to deal with, amen? I mean, we all have to, you know, I have to take medication to make sure that my blood pressure doesn't go too high, and, you know, there are little things you have to deal with. But look, look what it says here in Galatians 4.13. I want you to see this. Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. This is, this is Paul speaking. He's talking to the Galatian church. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. No, you took me in and cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Christ Jesus himself. But then he writes in verse 15, where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? I am sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. 
Now, that's another, we won't get into that one because that's another issue about, I think another thing that Paul dealt with, honestly, was that he was blind or he couldn't see very well. He was had a hard time with sight and he had things that, the ailment, whatever it was about his eyes, that caused him a lot of discomfort. So we're talking about something that is very real, sickness, illness, very real, even in the midst of their journeys. And I... I I appreciate what he said here in verse 14. Even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. That is a risk, isn't it? When, we, when you go before a, a group of people and you're not feeling well or you're sick and it's very obvious, that is more repulsive than it is a good thing. And, but they didn't have any control over this. It's not like they could just go necessarily and go see a doctor right away or do things like that. These guys are traveling. So it's, an, it's something to deal with. And maybe John Mark got sick. Maybe. We don't know for sure. Um, and the other thing that's mentioned here, and I'm not going to belabor it too much, going back to our, our text about John Mark leaving them and returning to Jerusalem, he could have just left and went back without telling them. Which would explain why Paul was really ticked off when later on we read in Acts about how I don't want to take John Mark with me because he probably abandoned us and just went back to where he was going to back where he, where he came from or went to Jerusalem. And that's something, well, you know what? Go to Acts chapter 15. It's, it's something we're going to wind up reading anyway. Acts chapter 15, it's right ahead of us here. And again, we want to see this context here because it's important for us to recognize this. And we're only in the first verse of, the, of our text. Acts chapter 15, verse 37. This was another place where they were going to be traveling to. They were going to be going back to different cities where they had preached just to see how people were doing. And it says in verse 37, Acts chapter 15, Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. Verse 38, but Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them there in their work. You see that? Deserted him. He left without telling him. That should eliminate a lot of the other speculation, right? I don't even know why they're speculating about it. He may have been, maybe he got sick and wanted to go back home, but didn't tell him. Maybe he just wasn't up for the trip. But clearly there was no communication. And this is important for us to see from a contextual standpoint because you wonder, why were Barnabas and Paul fighting? Well, Barnabas is going to take up for John and Mark because they're related. They're in the family. And he saw potential in John Mark. We'll just call him Mark. Um, that Paul at that time did not see. It's not uncommon that you'll have disagreements even within the ministry aspect of a church or in different places. But God will sometimes use those disagreements for his good. Because what happened with that? You know, Barnabas and, and, and Paul separated, went to Cyprus. Barnabas went to Cyprus with John Mark. Silas uh, went to Syria and Sicilia. Cilicia, excuse me. So there was an additional spreading of the gospel, frankly, that took place because they separated. I'm not condoning fighting or difficulty in the church. My message today is actually going to talk about that a little bit from a standpoint of what happens in today's churches. And I want you to see that God will use these situations even for his own good and his own glorification. So Mark went on and definitely wanted to continue in ministry because he went with Barnabas. And I want to point something out that's pretty important here too because this Mark that we're referring to is the same Mark that writes one of the Gospels by all accounts. Because we have different names that are assigned to different people that look at these things and see what happens. But Mark had to mature. Mark had to grow in what he was doing and learn about what he was doing. How, how important is it for us to recognize, too, that people who are younger 
and want to learn more about Jesus, sometimes they don't know everything or don't understand everything, that we have to be patient with them as people that we are discipling. We have to be patient with people who are younger. I, listen, I, I didn't know a whole lot when I was first getting involved in this ministry, and I still don't know a great deal. I'm learning more. I know more than I did before. But thankfully, people allowed me to be who I was so that I would learn something and grow in the position that I'm in today. I'm just using, I'm speaking for myself only because I can't speak for anybody else. But we as people who are discipling others need to give people the opportunity to grow and learn. And sometimes you just point them in a direction and let them take, take it over from there. But who is the one ultimately doing the teaching? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Lord who does the teaching. The Lord teaches every single one of us. We can sit here and take notes. We can sit and listen to a service and take notes as well too. But who has to teach you what you're writing down? The Holy Spirit does. The Spirit has to teach you. The Spirit reveals things to you as you go. And He reveals them to you in His perfect timing where you will have the maximum effect of understanding. Because sometimes you read scripture and say, oh boy, I really don't get this. I don't understand this at all. In his timing, he's going to reveal to you what you need to understand. And this is all about what Mark was about. He was young, probably not mature enough, still learning about what it was to travel and what it was to be on a missions trip. You know, are, are all missions trips that have ever been carried out in the, in the history of this world, have they all been successful? No, <laughs> for different reasons. But let's not discount the fact that sometimes they're not successful because the people who believe they were called for mission trips, they may not have been ready or they may not have been completely ready or able to assimilate to the culture that they were in. And sometimes it just seems like those missions trips are just slow, painfully slow processes of getting people to come on board with you. Our friends, the Amaris, you know, they're back in Berlin and they're back and doing their thing, uh, trying to reach people in Germany for the purpose of reaching them for the gospel. But it is a long process. You've got to develop relationships with people. You're, you're an American, you're going over and you might know how to speak the language. You might know something about the culture, but you've got to develop relationships with people. You can't just go and say, I'm here and here's the gospel. It's not going to work. And at the end of the day, that is what we need to re re look at when we look at John Mark. He was going, but he probably just was a reluctant missionary. And maybe he lacked courage. I, I, I hate to add words like that. I, he did, but he did go back to Jerusalem. So it's really important for us to not pass judgment. And the redeeming factor of this is that if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 real quick, 2 Timothy 4, and I want you to look at verse 11. I want you to see what Paul says. You know, this is later in life. This is where in 2 Timothy, this arguably is the last book that he wrote before he was uh, executed. 2 Timothy 4 verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Now, that's Paul speaking about Mark. Bring Mark with you when you come. He also knows that this is probably the end. So it's a good opportunity for people to rally around each other and bolster each other up in prayer and support because he knows that he's not going to get out of prison. I'm sure he's confident at this point. And he's writing this letter to Timothy. We'll be in 2 Timothy today, too, in our text. That's just a coincidence, but that's not a coincidence, because that's, that's how God works. So let's go back to our text here in Acts, chapter 13. Let's go to verse 14. But Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia, different city altogether than the other Antioch. 
On the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for the services. After the usual readings from the books of Moses and the prophets, those in charge of the service sent them this message. Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. Now, I want you to understand something about synagogue services. This was a custom. When you're traveling to a different place or a different city, you know, listen, uh, they were Jews. They went to the synagogue. That was customary. Any visiting city, any, any place they went to on the Sabbath, one of the things that they would do is they would go to the synagogue. And my lovely bride and I, every Monday, we drive by up in Euclid, Ohio. Is it Euclid or Wycliffe? I think it's Wycliffe. Wycliffe. There's a synagogue that's there right when you get off of Bishop, Bishop Road off of I-90. There's a, it's right down the road there, and there are people who live there, and you can see them dressed. Um, and some people are walking to the synagogue. They'll just go down to the synagogue. And synagogue service lasts about an hour. Uh, a little bit of research I did on this. It's, it's about an hour. And one of the things they actually do, I want you to go to Deuteronomy 6. One of the things that they actually do in the synagogue, they read from the Torah and they read um, from the Pentateuch, which are the first five books, depending upon what time of year it is. But they typically read from Deuteronomy 6, 4. So it's really cool to see this because it's, it's interesting when you look at this, that they spend this time, they recite what is called the Shema. It's, it's rel relatively ritualistic, everybody. You know, if you were to go to Mass, a Catholic Mass, there are things that are said that are very ritualistic as well, too. They do the same things every service. But at the synagogue, guess what they do? They read from Deuteronomy 6.4. I'm going to read down a little bit. Um, starting at 6.4, I'm going to take it down to verse, uh, verse 9. That's for the benefit of my bride who's putting the text online. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Now, just as a, a side note, sometimes they read that passage repeatedly. Maybe in the same set of sentences. But I'll read down further. And you, verse 5, And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit, to yourself, commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So this is a very specific thing at the synagogue. These are very specific readings that they did every single time they met. And they would add other passages within the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They would add passages within those five books and read them. These were the ancient scriptures. These were the holy scriptures. And every Jew, worth his salt, knew everything about these passages. But would read them over and over again and repeat them as reminders about what God is telling them to do. What's the most important thing? The Lord our God is the Lord alone. But what was the plight that many of our Israelites had back in the day? They worshipped other gods. It was constant. Satan was constantly upending the Israelites all the time because they paid less attention to God himself and more attention to inanimate, lifeless gods that they carved out of stones and set them up and worshipped them. Well, if I were God, I'd be ticked off too. Because it didn't make sense for them to do something like that. But what it really is, everybody, if you need to understand something about why they worshipped other gods, to focus on other gods means you're really focusing on your own flesh. If you want a god of fertility, you're going to want to focus on something like that for the sake of you doing everything you want to do when it comes to sexual behaviors. You get it? That's how they rolled back then. So recognizing that this was a plight, these prayers were spoken, they read through the books, 
and they would read from the prophets some sort of a, a book of the law and then they would give a sermon. This is the synagogues I'm referring to. And those who were in charge of the service, it may have been a rabbi, it may have been other people, they would, they would determine who would give the sermon. Different people were chosen every week. It wasn't always just one person. Now, what happens, the synagogue leader, if they recognize there are visitors that are coming in, that's where it came here and back in verse 15. Um, those in charge of the service sent the message, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. They were recognized as visiting Jews. They were traveling. So let's go back to our passage. Verse 16. So Paul stood, lifted his hand to quiet them and started speaking. Men of Israel, he said, and you God-fearing Gentiles, listen to me. Now, that's a very commanding statement, isn't it? And when we look at this place where they're at, I want to make sure that you understand that they are, these are practicing Jews in Antioch of Pisidia. They're practicing Jews. They already, um, Pisidia is a city that is probably best, if you, if you want to use a word, a modern term of a word of what Antioch of Pisidia represents. It's a Jewish city, but it's a city of logistics because they had good roads, they had a lot of trade, a lot of things went back and forth. You got your FedExes, you got your UPSs, a lot of stuff flowed through there, they had good roads to move. So there were a lot of people that came through there, a lot of people who traveled through there. And this was a new city that they had gone to, and now Paul was getting ready to get up and speak to them. And understand something about going to the synagogue you've got and this is what we kind of talk about you as we every almost every monday we talk about this when we travel uh to wickliffe because we're going skating that's where we're going everybody okay we go skating and we pass through there to go to the roller skating rink but one thing we talk about when we, when we start talking about going to the synagogue these people are not talking about jesus it's not in the scripture it's not, it is there, but it's not. They're not looking at it. Because we know that there's a prophetic message about Jesus Christ in all 66 books of the Bible, not just in the New Testament, not just in the place where we see him live. And of course, there are manifestations of him as the pre-incarnate Christ all throughout the Old Testament. But they don't see it that way. So we have to recognize that because they don't understand who Jesus is or they have a different idea about who this Jesus should be. There's all kinds of ideas about who Jesus is depending upon what culture you go to. And because he didn't take over when they asked him, are you, is, are you coming now to take over the kingdom? When the apostles asked Jesus that very question, what was Jesus' answer? It's not for you to determine or, or for me to reveal to you what time I'm going to do this. Because at the end of the day, Jesus didn't come to take over. He came to give, give of himself so that we would give our hearts to him. That's why he came the first time. He came for our salvation. And of course, they didn't understand that at the time. But... We want to recognize that what Paul is going to do now in this passage is going to talk about the emphasis initially about God's covenant with Israel, but also that Jesus is now going to be shown as this person where the focus needs to be. So let's take it all the way down. Men, and, uh, men of Israel, he said, you and, God, you and God fearing Gentiles, listen to me. Now, verse 17, the God of this nation of Israel chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. It's interesting, every story, if you remember this, starts with them being in captivity and being rescued. That's the relevance of this. It starts with Moses and that time. Every single one. Because people can relate to that. They know what it is. They remember it. They understand it. 
Then with a powerful army led them out of their slavery. Verse 18, he put up with them through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He put up with them. What does that mean? You stiff-necked people. I just rescued you out of Egypt. I just re released you from slavery. 400 some odd years of slavery. And this is the thanks I get? Grumbling, complaining, and moaning. So yeah, God put up with them. Then he destroyed seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to Israel as an inheritance. And honestly, they didn't deserve that. But it was really the faithful ones, the younger people who paid attention. Because we have to understand that during that time of wandering, 40 years, he lopped off a generation of folks who were released from Egypt because they were not following the Lord. Those people died in the wilderness. It should give you pause when you see how God works. He knows the hearts of every person. Verse 20, all this took about 450 years. After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of Samuel the prophet. We know about the time of judges, right? What's the last verse in, one of the, in the book of Judges? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They, had, they didn't have a king. They, didn't have any, they did not look to God as a leader. They looked to everybody else or everything else. Everyone did what there was right in their own eyes. Until Samuel. Then the people begged for a king. And of course, Samuel said, are you crazy? Why are you begging for a king? You, all you need to do is focus on the Lord. But the Lord told them, let them have their king. That's what they wanted. So God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned 40 year, for 40 years. Verse 22, but God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And the young, early David, he did. God used him mightily. Verse 23, and it is one of King David's descendants. Very important that Paul mentions this for relevance for the present, their present. One of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised Savior of Israel, who is God's promised Savior of Israel. Now understand, if you're listening to this in the synagogue right now, the hairs might go up in the back of your neck because they don't have any dealings with this. They don't believe this. But it's being told to them anyway. Look, just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it isn't true. Amen? You know, I borrowed that from David Jeremiah because he said that several times. He says, look, just because I don't believe what the Bible says, well, just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it isn't true. You just don't believe it. It doesn't cancel out the truth in the Bible because you think, oh, I, don't, I choose not to believe it. Or I won't read the book of Revelation because I don't like what it says. Yes, people have actually said silly stuff like that. And we will be doing a study in the future on Revelation. Just so you know. So, batten down the hatches when that happens. Well, I'll tell you, I can't wait for that one. Verse 24, before he came, John the Baptist preached that all the people of Israel needed to repent of their sins and turn to God and be baptized. And what was John the Baptist doing? Paving the way for Jesus. But we had to have hearts of repentance. We were not living right. We weren't doing what we were supposed to be doing. I mean, this applies to us. We know we weren't living right before we became believers. The real challenge is for people who get, become saved or become believers at around seven or eight years old. They have a very basic knowledge of who Jesus is at that time, but boy, they got a challenge ahead of them because they need to learn more and more about developing this relationship. And when we're children, we don't necessarily grasp things the way adults do. So I'm not questioning anybody's salvation when they get saved at a young age, but I'm telling you right now, it's, it's, you, if you see challenges in that person's life, Go back to them and say, remember what you did when you were seven years old? Why did you do that? I didn't know I was going to talk about that. But we need to understand that this is really important to grasp. 
do you really understand what it is about turning away from a lifestyle that you don't you shouldn't be living and turning to the one who can help you through and heal you through that lifestyle that you were living before and now be a new creation in Christ a new creation one thing that's true Simone Simone Biles' mother uh, was was on and talking about this and, and it's very true she and she said something that was very truthful I was an addict and I still am an addict a drug addict I'm not gonna get into all the motivation behind why she said what she said in front of the 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 Daily Mail in in London doesn't really matter at this point but one truth that you take out of that is that once you're an addict you are an addict for life because you need the help of Jesus Christ to help you to beat the addiction in your flesh you will not do it Christ has to be who you look to to do something like this and that's what we need to recognize here so Paul is setting the stage to teach us and tell us about how we need to truly learn about who Jesus Christ is and the people in the synagogue are going to we're going to continue this next week and talk about this more but what are the takeaways for today there are takeaways Takeaways, first of all, about learning about John Mark. Mark left and went back to Jerusalem while he was traveling with them. So you could say at the beginning of this is that John Mark was a failure. You could make that conclusion. You know, if you don't, listen, if you play a game and you don't win, you, you lose, that's a failure. The expectations of a team that's playing a, a, a sport, there's a lot of, personal pride in doing the best you can do and you know Georgia and Clemson played yesterday and you would think that a matchup on paper that'd be a pretty close matchup it was an obliteration <laughs> I'm not admitting that I'm just saying it but that's a loss a defeat is a defeat there's no other way to look at it one point loss or a 31 point loss but Paul and Barnabas kept going they couldn't worry about where Mark was and so at the end of the day Paul had to come back to the fact that well he just didn't give Mark a chance he wasn't ready he went along but he wasn't ready well that's true for a lot of us and stuff sometimes we're not ready there are certain things that happen we've had a gentleman come and speak to us as a church he wasn't ready to speak it's not about names or anything like that he just wasn't ready he couldn't finish whether it was nerves or whatever you know it might have been nerves might he maybe he felt like he was prepared and he wasn't prepared but we don't condemn the guy. You pray for him, you lift him up, he'll, he'll get it together eventually. And we need to recognize this as we're discipling people. That's one of the takeaways for today. Be patient. Be patient. And give correction where correction is needed. Give correction where correction is needed. Be gentle with the correction. Do it in a godly manner. You don't go and tell somebody, oh man, you sucked when you went up there and did that. That is not us, amen? We don't say that. You want to be encouraging. And the other takeaway, let's pray for our Jewish brothers and sisters. They're the chosen nation. They're the, they're the chosen people. God loves these people. He loves Israel. And he has blessed Israel in spite of their hard-heartedness and some, in spite of their stiff-necked behavior. You know, not everybody who goes to Israel, for example, we know people who have been, who are Jewish, have gone over to Israel to live, but it doesn't mean they're practicing and following Jesus. They're following 
God or maybe they're not even following God. That's the other thing, too. They don't necessarily have to be going to the synagogues. You remember, church attendance has gone all the way down across the board, including at synagogues. There's only a handful of families in different synagogues that are actually there worshiping God. And remember what we said about Cornelius earlier, too. A man devout and faithful, but he was not a Jew, but he knew to follow the Lord. But his heart was ready for God to speak to him about Jesus Christ because of his faith. We need other Jews to have that same type of heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we've spent in your word. And we thank you, Lord, for opening us up to remembering other people that we know who need to have this relationship with you. Lord, we pray for them that you'll speak to them and that their hearts will be ready to hear what you have to say. Lord, mold them and shape them even before they come to a knowledge of you. Prepare them. Speak to them. Have them wrestle with you, Lord. We know that indeed as they wrestle with you to figure out what they're supposed to be doing, you'll speak to them about what they should do. And we thank you. Lord, we ask that you bless, bless us now. Bless this church. Bless the people online. Bless them and keep them, Lord, that they indeed recognize how valuable it is to have this relationship with you. How wonderful it is that you teach us and speak to us. We give you praise and thanks for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for this edition of Livestream Sunday School for Akron Alliance Fellowship Church. Join us next week as we continue in this study in the book of Acts chapter 13, and we'll continue with Paul's message to the people. For those of you online, stay tuned online. In about nine minutes, you'll see the pre-recording of the message today, the last days of the church. And also stay online with us if for the live version of church if you're not coming here to church today. God bless you and take care of yourselves. Enjoy your first Sunday. And we will see you around the corner and see you next time.